Thanks for joining us, everyone. We're just getting things under, letting everybody into the webinar and we'll be getting things underway in just a moment. Thank you for joining us, everyone. We're going to be getting started in just a moment. Good evening, everyone. My name is John Taves, and I'm the event coordinator here at McNally Robinson Booksellers. We're broadcasting tonight from Treaty One territory, that's the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples in the homeland of the Métis Nation. In addition, McNally Robinson Booksellers itself rests on the land once occupied by the Métis community of Roostertown. I will point out that imperfect automatically generated subtitles are available just by clicking the CC button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, I'll be introducing tonight's speakers and saying a little bit about the book uh, in just a moment too. The only other thing I will point out is that there will be the opportunity to ask questions of tonight's speakers. Now you in the audience can ask those questions simply by writing them in the Q&A box, which you can also find just at the bottom of the Zoom screen. So thank you all so very much. We're looking forward to a really active and lively discussion. We are gathered here virtually to celebrate the prairie launch of We Go Where They Go, the story of anti-racist action. Um, we're delighted to have two of its authors here, as well as two local activists who are also going to be speaking to the book and the rich history of ARA. We're also really delighted to be partnering with the University of Regina Press on this event as well. So thank you very much to them for not only making this event happen, but also, of course, for publishing the book in the first place. So we'll be hearing a little bit more about this book, uh, about the storied history of anti-fascism at the ARA, uh, as well as where we go from here and how cultural scenes can become powerful forces for change as evidenced in the pages of this book and in the day-to-day -day reality around us. Now, I uh, won't take up too much of your time right out of the gate. I'll be back at the end just to remind you that you can, again, purchase copies of this book from McNally Robinson Booksellers online uh, by visiting us in store or by giving us a call. Wherever you are, we'll find a way to get a copy of this uh, very important and excellent book to you. And uh, now I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the speakers that you'll be hearing from tonight. Uh, so as I mentioned, we have two of the authors here tonight. The first person you'll be hearing from, Michael Staudenmeyer, is a veteran of many anti-fascist, anti-imperialist, and anarchist projects, including work with ARA Chicago in the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, he is the author of Truth and Revolution, a history of the Sojourner Truth Organization, 69 to 86. Uh, the other co-author that's with us tonight is Kristen Schwartz. Uh, Kristen grew up with the Toronto chapter of ARA from 1992 until 2003. She has produced several audio documentaries, including Women, The Oppressed Majority, The Latin American Revolution, and The Ravaging of Africa. Um, with forgiveness for my clumsy pronunciation, Thomas J. Briere, Kakakoni, Pawanak Hima, also known as Little Whirlwinds in the Snow, is a Cree Ojibwe from Winnipeg, Manitoba. He resides on the unceded traditional territory of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, and uh, Squamish. His maternal lineage can be traced back to the Nehiau people of uh, Op Opiwasak, uh, Cree Nation, OCN, while his paternal side belongs to the Anishinaabe community of uh, Kochicheng First Nation. He is a former organizer and co-founder of United Against Racism, UAR, a chapter of anti-racist action, and currently works with the Canadian Anti-Racist Research Society, or CARES, to combat systemic racism in Canada. Uh, Thomas believes in the power of education and advocacy to effect meaningful change, and is dedicated to creating a more just and equitable world. Uh, your host for this evening is Omar Kinnerath, uh, an anti-racist activist and a community organizer who lives here in Winnipeg. Amongst other efforts, he has founded Fascist Free Treaty One and Mutual Aid Society Winnipeg, which to date has 14,000 members and has become a vital resource for the citizens of Winnipeg. He was also voted uh, one of the favorite local activists in the Uniter Magazine's 2022 poll. So here to host this event, please join me in welcoming Omar Kinnerath. 
Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining the webinar. Uh, it's great to be here with the authors of the book, which I just recently finished a couple of days ago. Um, and I feel it's an important work, uh, especially in the climate that we're in right now, and a vital resource for um, younger folks who are interested in um, anti-fascist, anti-racist organizing. Um, a little background about myself here. I'm 43 years old, so that kind of puts me kind of in, in the younger age bracket of one when, when ARA was uh, was formed in Winnipeg. Um, so um, I definitely, you know, did go to their events and uh, and appreciated their work, especially me being a racialized person here. Uh, and from there, you know, knowing that it existed and and having a lot of friends that were involved in that type of work, when it really came down to like these fascist organizations starting to pop up in late 2016, 2017, I felt like something had to be done. Um, so myself and a couple of former ARA, um, uh, ARA organizers, Euron Walter and Helmut Harry Lowen, we decided to form FF1 as sort of a response to that, basically using the same tactics that we learned from uh, being involved in, in ARA. Um, in the 90s. Um, I feel a lot's changed uh, um, in the last 20 something years, but a lot has a lot has stayed the same. I mean, we still have uh, fascist organizing in, in, physically, but I think, and I, we'll get to this later of how that affects, how that affects it kind of in the, in, in the modern age with organizing online and how we'd be able to combat that. So, I mean, I'm definitely interested in what the authors have to say and like definitely um, can't wait for all your questions that you have. Um, I guess the first person that I'm going to introduce is one of the authors. Uh, Michael, would you like to go and speak on, on the book a little and introduce yourself? Sure, absolutely. Thanks, Omar. Thanks, John. Thank you all for being here this evening. Um, I'm really excited for this event. The, the mix of voices tonight, I think, is going to be really great. Uh, what I had decided I would contribute initially, at least, is uh, a very brief reading from the introduction to the book here in my hands, um, and then a kind of quick summary of sort of core elements that defined ARA. Uh, so, the introduction to the book begins with a vignette that describes an event that took place in Minneapolis in the United States in 1995. Um, and this is, I think it's about four paragraphs um, that flows pretty quickly. So I'll, I'll begin with that and then offer some uh, initial comments. The Nazis had a wedding hall, but ARA had a baseball team. Near the end of May, it finally starts to feel like summer in the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, Minnesota. It begins to feel like anything is possible and optimism runs deep regardless of your politics. St. Paul's local neo-Nazi band, Bound for Glory, fresh off a show in Idaho in honor of Adolf Hitler's birthday, decided to plan a high security concert in St. Paul for Saturday, May 20th, 1995, and the local branch of anti-racist action, ARA, decided to stop them. Years before, ARA had used physical confrontation to make it impossible for Nazi bands to perform publicly in the Twin Cities, and they weren't about to let it start all over again. Through what longtime member Kieran later called pre-internet age detective work, ARA determined that would-be Nazi show attendees had been told to pick up tickets and a map to the secret venue at a public park on St. Paul's east side. On the day of the show, ARA affiliated activists reserved a permit for a picnic and softball game in the park, but this was no typical ball game. The 90 or so anti-fascists who showed up shared one or two softballs, a handful of mitts, and an assortment of about 75 aluminum and wooden bats. Those not playing ball rode bicycles around the perimeter of the park and used walkie-talkies to alert everyone when a suspicious car approached. Beyond the bats, one other weapon was on hand. An older comrade, a Vietnam veteran supportive of ARA, was positioned away from the group with a single concealed firearm, 
The agreed upon plan was that the anti-fascists would accept a brawl and take a beating if it was unavoidable, but that if any fascist pulled a gun, this comrade was authorized to act as necessary. In the end, everything went right for ARA and wrong for the Nazis. There was no violence at all. Whoever had been expected to hand out tickets and maps never showed. A handful of cars with Nazi fans drove into the park, and each time, as Kieran put it, a large crew of community baseball players headed over to greet them. Without exception, the Nazis drove right back out again empty-handed. ARA sleuths had also identified the concert venue, an empty wedding hall on St. Paul's west side. For a couple of days prior to the show, activists went door to door in the neighborhood to alert people about the hate to be unleashed that Saturday night. As a result, when the picnic and ball game had successfully concluded and dozens of militants drove to the venue to confront the band, they found hundreds of confused and angry neighbors already filling the street in a spontaneous protest. The neighbors wanted the show shut down at least as much as ARA did. The police, and eventually even the mayor of St. Paul, arrived on the scene to defuse the community's anger and to avoid a riot, according to Kieran. They finally announced that the show was being called off for public safety reasons. Police drove the band members and the few fans who had managed to show up away from the venue. The protest turned to celebration as the sun set on a warm early summer evening. So that's the way the book begins and hopefully it gives you a sense of the kind of, uh, those kinds of stories we're interested in telling. Um, at the same time, it's important to give a, a very brief kind of overview of what ARA was. Um, the simplest explanation is that anti-racist action was a decentralized network of local grassroots anti-fascists um, from the mid 90s onward. It was somewhat coordinated through the anti-racist action network, but ARA groups existed both before the network um, going all the way back to the mid 1980s and after the ARA network eventually changed its name to the Torch Antifa Network. Um, about a dozen years ago now. Um, ARA groups generally were militant in the sense that you can get uh, 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 an example of from the opening vignette I just read. They were also confrontational in that way. And importantly, for many people who are involved in ARA, ARA was genuinely a fun group to be part of. Um, that has something to do with the fact that ARA was largely, though never exclusively, based in younger circles of activists. Um, and it was within youth groups largely based in subcultures, particularly punk uh, DIY sorts of subcultures. Um, and that allowed the group to grow in a dynamic way that we try to describe in the book that went beyond simply um, militant confrontation, right? It allowed the group to grow in, in a positive and, and cultural way. And in fact, one of the kind of key elements of ARA was the awareness that culture could be a, uh, a political conflict zone, if that makes sense. Um, and then the last item I would sort of emphasize is that uh, ARA attempted to balance um, mass organizing, getting large numbers of people, getting almost 100 anti-fascists out um, for uh, the baseball game in Minneapolis, St. Paul in 1995, um, balancing that mass element with the militancy that I've already described. Um, from the moment that ARA became a semi-organized, decentralized network in 1995, uh, the network adopted a set of points of unity. There were four of them. And the title of our book is in fact taken from uh, the first sentence of the first of the four points of unity. So I'll read the whole first point of unity and then try to summarize the other three. Um, and then I'll hand off to, to Kristen. Um, the first point of unity reads, we go where they go. Whenever fascists are organizing or active in public, we're there. We don't believe in ignoring them or staying away from them. Never let the Nazis have the streets. So that's the first point of unity and really defines largely the practical work uh, of ARA in an important um, 
uh, frame. The second point of unity is to not rely upon the state, we, we refer to it as the cops and the courts, to do the work of militant anti-fascist um, efforts. Um, and uh, that was an important aspect of uh, sort of autonomous organizing and self-defense organizing, if you will. Third point of unity um, described ARA as being a place that embraced non-sectarian defense of other anti-fascists. We can talk more about this, um, but we were never an ideologically unified grouping. Lots of people from lots of different versions of left-wing politics were always active in ARA at any given time. And then the fourth point of unity is probably the most uh, sort of political in a way. Um, and it also is the one point of unity that was changed formally was amended uh, in 1998. So initially it contained this um, statement of uh, ARA net intends to do the hard work necessary to build a strong movement against racism, sexism, anti-Semitism, homophobia, discrimination against the disabled, the oldest, the youngest, and the most oppressed. And it ended with the sentence, we intend to win. In 1998, it's important to note that after an extensive political battle that we describe in the book in chapter six, that fourth point of unity was amended to include an initial sentence that reads, I'm trying to pull up the page, um, that reads, we support abortion rights and unrestricted reproductive freedom for all. Uh, so that became the final version of the fourth point of unity. Um, with that, I'd love to hand it off to Kristen, who I think is going to talk more about the book and, and what we try to do in it. Um, and we'll go from there. Awesome. Thanks for that uh, wonderful introduction to uh, the book and to anti-racist action. Uh, I want to thank McNally's for hosting, uh, to Omar for moderating, and to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, so for my part of these opening remarks, I'm just going to quickly review how the book came to be and what's in it. Um, so while ARA's activities in Canada especially, received a fair amount of media attention at the time and have been touched on in a few books. Uh, we Go Where They Go is the first full treatment of the story of this, uh, this youth movement. And uh, our co-author Shannon got the ball rolling uh, some years back when he got interested in the story as a student historian um, he was a child when most of the events described in the book happened, um, but he got inspired, he got interested as a musician, he got uh, through the music scenes, and he met a number of past ARA people who grew to like him and trust him, and slowly the rest of us co-authors who were all involved in different chapters of ARA at the time kind of coalesced around Shannon and uh uh, just soon after the election of Trump and the sort of explosion of far right activity that followed, um, I, that motivated, I think, all of us to, uh, you know, get our archival materials out of the closets and out of the basements and try and do something to share the experience that we had had. So the book itself is mainly chronological. It opens with the genesis of ARA in the youth subcultures of the late 1980s and early 1990s in the US and in Canada. And then it covers how uh, anti-racists in the US, Midwest especially, met each other and began to build a movement as they mobilized against these regular recruitment rallies of the Ku Klux Klan in cities and towns. And the you know, chapter two goes into like just what the pace of that work was like. I mean, it was kind of crazy, um, you know, how much was involved in trying to, um, you know, reduce the effectiveness of this KKK strategy and prevent them from growing. Um, eventually, these anti-racists formalized themselves and called themselves ARA and formalized a network. Uh, so the next chapter, chapter three, documents how that model uh, was spreading into Canada and the sort of activities and greatest hits of ARA across the country. So I'm from Toronto, where our chapter of ARA helped to bring down the Heritage Front, which was 
at that time, the most successful far right group in Canada since World War II. Um, and uh, we go into the, you know that story in some detail. Um, but we also share stories from many other cities, um, Edmonton, uh, Montreal, uh, Kitchener, Waterloo, Vancouver, you know, because um, the we were able to organize with people uh, on a, in a similar way in many cities and of course in Winnipeg as well. And um, we'll get to that very soon. Um, one set of the stories in this chapter concerns the efforts of ARA to challenge white power music. So this was, um, uh, you know, the far right was, um, you know, taking a page from what, what, you know, from the youth subcultures and trying to organize, uh, trying to um, uh, put together uh, something attractive for young people themselves. So they were also recording bands and distributing fanzines and so on um, in support of like white power music. And uh, ARA saw it as an important target of our work. And we, um, because many of the key players at that time were Canadian, uh, we cover that 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 set of activities uh, in the Canadian chapter as well. Um, so the next part of the book sort of departs from the chronological report approach to look at three broader themes. Uh, first, uh, how ARA groups organized against systemic racism, uh, racism among the police, for example, or um, in terms of economics. Uh, and we look at uh, five different cities and how they approached that question because there was never one sort of overarching approach within ARA. Um, and uh, that that chapter really gets at the kind of uh, kind of more granular nature of what what how the chapters functioned and what they were like in different cities and towns. Um, the next chapter concerns uh, the the campaign uh, the internal development that Mike was talking about earlier. Uh, around abortion access and choice. Um, many ARI groups got involved in uh, different campaigns to defend uh, abortion access, to defend reproductive freedom, and, uh, and against homophobia as well. And this chapter kind of looks at that in, again, several different cities and towns and how that, how that played out on the ground, as well as at the overall network level and how that political development happened. Um, uh, so then the, the chapter after that uh, concerns the all important relationship between ARA as a political movement and the youth culture scenes that it grew out of the relationship to bands, to like uh, popular culture, uh, touches a little bit on like how ARA was covered in different kinds of media, uh, that sort of thing. Um, so that takes us to the last third of the book, which sheds light on the some events that weakened ARA uh, that um, uh, sort of brought about its slow demise, um, and also its lar last large scale campaigns, primarily in the United States and their successes. Um, and finally, the legacy of ARA and lessons that we help people might take from the book and from our experience. And just to touch on that briefly, um, you know, Mike addressed this a bit too, that, you know, some of the lessons that we hope that people will take out of it is like the value of being both militant and public facing at the same time. Like ARA wasn't a closed off group in the shadows. It strove to grow, to continuously recruit new people and to be genuinely popular. Uh, ARA also strove to be non-sectarian, to incorporate, incorporate people with different political views. Um, uh, having the perfect line was less important than having each other's backs. And overall, ARA was quite practical and focused on getting results. Um, and finally, the importance when doing this type of work of having quality information about the far right. Um, and, you know, we you know, many of us put a strong focus on that. And certainly today, uh, people have taken that skill set to like another level, uh, what with everything that's available online and so on. So I, th I think um, I, I also just wanted to say a word about uh, like the 
the image quality and the poor lighting. Uh, I'm driving back into Toronto right now with friends because earlier today we attended the funeral for Pierre George, uh, brother of Dudley George. And I just wanted to say a couple words about, about them. Um, Pierre and Dudley were involved in the struggle of the people of Ajudana, known in English as Stony Point, to reclaim their reserve lands, which had been taken from them in 1943. Uh, um, at that time, the Department of Defense said it needed the land to build a military base and they'd return the land after the war, but they never did at least not until the people of Stony Point moved back onto their territories in the 1990s. Um, and in the course of this struggle, Dudley George was killed by a sniper of the Ontario Provincial Police on September 6, 1995. His brother, Pierre, um, really worked very hard in the years after the death of his brother to get some measure of justice. And um, it was an important uh, like ARA, we did our best uh, to support him in that. And uh, so I'm just remembering Pierre tonight. Uh, with that, I think I'd like to wrap up my part and hand it over to Thomas, who I believe will be sharing some stories from Winnipeg. So thank you, everybody. Thomas, if I can just cut in very briefly, we have photos of images in our book that relate specifically to the situation. Kristen was just describing. Well, thank you, Kristen. Well, it's nice seeing everybody. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the history of uh, United Against Racism. It was a chapter of ARA. Um, you know, we were very proud of um, starting United Against Racism. Uh, originally, it was a group of skinheads that came together and rude boys, um, and we we would often fight Nazis on the streets, at gigs, at coffee shops, um, you know, in schoolyards, um, and uh, you know, it came to a time where we thought that we needed to do more and to become more active, um, and we connected with an organization called Manitoba Coalition Against Racism Apartheid, and we met uh, Helmut Harry Lowen. Um, and from then on, we started uh, to recruit people that are were outside of our scene, outside of the skinhead scene, um, and uh, in, basically bring people in to make it more inclusive so more people would be uh, interested because, you know, the Nazis had affected um, more people in within the Winnipeg street scene, uh, the punk scene, skaters. So everybody came together to oppose them. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try sharing my screen here. Uh, please bear with me. It might uh, take me a minute here. Okay, can you see my screen now? Kristen or anybody? Just wanted to make uh, sure. Not yet, unfortunately. Not yet. Okay, hold on a second. Okay. How does it look now? You're good to go. Looks great. Okay, this was uh, our big school photo. Well, this was the uh, the uh, a, gr a group probably later on in the the later uh, 1990s, where we all got together in Osborne Village and uh, had a group photo after one of the demos um, in Osborne Village. So. As you can see, there's a, a quite a wide range of people, and they range from, um, you know, the uh, older people to quite the uh, a young group. Uh, this was the uh, that same group of people, but everybody that were kind of identified as skinheads within the organization or within the group. And there's me at the end. 
Um, this one I wanted to have a base, basically a brief introduction on, um, you know, the skinhead scene and uh, and anti-racism was very linked to kind of the music. This is a a concert uh, in the '90s with the Pie Tasters, which were a ska band. And uh, later on that evening, there was a big fight with the, the Hammerskins that came into that concert. And uh, we had to fight them out the door. And the band came off the stage and fought them with us. Um, it's a very potent memory in my mind. Uh, this is one of the co-founders of uh, United Against Racism, Yaron Walter. Um, you know, a very young picture of us. And, uh, you know, this was at the uh, Winnipeg Law Courts. We had attended a lot of uh, demonstrations. We put on a lot of, uh, um, of support demos. This was for uh, Pat Martin, I believe, when he was um, attacked by the Northern Hammerskins. Um, there was also a big connection with, uh, with the ARA, United Against Racism, and music. Um, a big part of uh, what we did on the fun side was we organized Rock Against Racisms. Um, we were able to get some uh, bands to play. A lot of the local ska bands came to play. Uh, some of the bigger Winnipeg bands came to play, um, like Propagandi. Um, I believe we had one of the biggest uh, Rock Against Racisms in, uh, in Canada, anyways. And uh, this was, I believe, at the Rendezvous. Uh, and it was a quite an enormous event. I could be wrong. My years kind of fold into each other now that I'm getting older. <laughs> um, you know, we would uh, um, have demos at the uh, the law courts, but also at the Manitoba legislature for different causes, different issues. Um, a thing that that stuck out in my mind uh, was the artwork and a lot of the. Uh, the posters people would create and the the graphic design and a lot of the images are uh, quite potent. Oh, this was a demo for Gordon Cuddy. He was murdered in Winnipeg. Um, you know, there was a wide range of people. They weren't all just skinheads or young people. There were old people. Uh, Winnipeg has a, a substantial history uh, fighting fascism going back to the old market square in 1934. Um, we had been uh, quite motivated by some of the older anti-fascists, uh, some of the some people from the Communist Party, um, some people from other organizations, some uh, elder um, anti-fascists. And they were able to give us a lot of insight on um, the issues that we would face and had to face. Uh, this was uh, another photo of us uh, outside the Manitoba Law Courts uh, when Pat Martin was assaulted by the Northern Haberskins. Um, they uh, they would show up in force and try to intimidate uh, Pat Martin because there was not very much security at the law courts and, you know, a bunch of uh, Nazis showing up trying to intimidate him while he's waiting to give testimony. So we decided to show up and support him and sit with him and uh, faced off against some of the, the Hammerskins. So we, we spent a lot of time at the law courts um, supporting him. But it was always kind of like a, uh, not a happy occasion, but we were there to support him and it was a very positive energy. There's inside the law courts. I don't know if you can take pictures inside of us now. Uh, this is a, a very funny picture because of the police in the background and. Um, Doug, which was an old communist that I looked up to, is also in the back. Um, you know, so we all came together. We had a very wide range of people who, who uh, came together with the uh, United Against Racism. You know, we set up hotlines. We put set up, put out flyers. Um, you know, though we were um, we originally originated as a bunch of skinheads. We um, we decided to reach out to the larger community and then it became um, quite large throughout the 1990s. Um, we met the 
Minneapolis Baldies and Minneapolis ARA. And we've made some very strong connections with them. Um, and to this day, we're I'm still friends with Kieran. Um, we also travel to different parts of Canada. I uh, attended the a Youth Against Hate conference in Toronto that uh, ARA put on in 1996. Um, I remember that it was sponsored by the Can Canadian Anti-Racism Education Research Society. Um, and that's where I met Alan Dutton, which had been uh, an anti-fascist working in uh, British Columbia for a very long time. Um, and that's where uh, I basically used a lot of the things that we did in Winnipeg and uh, kind of moved my career forward. In Winnipeg, um, a lot of what we did was doxing Nazis, because as you could see by the our photographs, you know, not all of us were big guys um, compared to, you know, uh, enormous neo-Nazis um, that we would have to fight against. Often we did have to fight them, uh, but, you know, when you have to fight against big roid monsters, it's, you know, <laughs> things might uh, end poorly. So what we did was we um, collected a lot of data, a lot of information, and we made that available um, to whoever, whoever wanted it. So once you collect data on people, they're less anonymous. You know, a bunch of guys jump out and beat somebody up that look like, uh, you know, bald heads and boots. Um, you know, a lot of the time, once we have a, a substantial enough database, we're able to recognize people. We know where they live. We know where they work. We know where their family lives. We know who their parents are. So you can put a lot of pressure to bear um, once you have all of that information, which, uh, you know, that's a very, was a very early form of doxing. Um, and uh, I just wanted to to kind of close out saying that um, without some of the um, mentorship and friendship that we received from people like Alan Dutton and Helmut Harry Lowen and some people from the Communist Party and other activists um, that really helped us through some of the hard periods, um, you know, we owe a lot to them. Um, however, however uh, it was a very good time uh, um, being active in Winnipeg. You know, I, I still have the old school uh, United Against Racism. Yaron Walter designed this card and, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm pretty happy with those memories. And I got this shirt in 1996 at the conference. I'll, uh, I'll send it to you, Omar. Thanks. Oh, it was awesome, uh, Thomas. It was it was also nice to see like some of my friends in their baby phase phases and some of those moves. Like you got an Andrew Newfelt from Comeback Kid in one of those posters, like one of those pictures. He must be like 13, 14 in that picture because he's a couple younger years younger than me. So just seeing that was just like brought back a lot of memories. And yeah, like Thomas said, we do owe a lot, especially on the prairies, to people like Helmet Harry Lowen, who is, you know, like for myself in the for, forming of, of FF1. You kind of like 2016 to 2017 helped us out a lot and we basically took the same playbook as ara uh, which is a lot different than the quote unquote antifa organizations do across the country and across north america because we are very public people um i'm, I'm not afraid to be on camera speaking about these things or you know have my face out there and being on social media and whatnot so i i think that's I don't know, like it might, like, I think it's, and I, I have this conversation with a lot of folks all the time. I think punks and skinheads and hardcore kids just get it, right? They, uh, they understand because our numbers were always so small, but so tight and, and so cohesive that we didn't want anybody to come from outside and, and like hurt one of us, right? Um, so I guess that's where the overall militancy that stands today here in Winnipeg comes from because people who are involved in the anti-racist, anti-fascist uh, sort of movement here in Winnipeg, the, the vast majority of them come from the punk rock and hardcore scene and, and, and former skinheads or whatnot. So, um, but it's very important to note and 
my question to like either the folks on the panel is like what changed from like this ultra militancy and vigilance that that we had in the 90s that in some form we still have in Winnipeg today I don't know Winnipeg's just a hard place and you know what I mean like it just feels like people are like just don't take the bullshit um where is now when we talk about community self-defense when we talk about self-defense we get into the conversation about violence right um now I've been criticized and we've been criticized as an organization on some of our tactics of kind of promoting violence, you know, punch a Nazi in the face, don't let them, you know, we go where they go, that kind of stuff, right? Um, and I want to ask you folks, in, in like in your summation, what what's changed over the last 20 years to have the, these types of anti-fascist, anti-racist movements become sort of liberalized in the mainstream where we are, they are a lot relying on politicians and cops in the courts and when people step up and do direct confrontation, um, we're looked at as radicals. So I want to open that up to, to for you folks. Anybody who wants to, to jump in, just go ahead and jump. Well, I think um, Winnipeg has a long history. Like Winnipeg's a pretty violent place. And, um, you know, a lot of the time you're dealing with gangs, you're dealing with uh, violence on a day to day basis. But, you know, it's a, a currency that people use um, and it's effective, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I found that um, being a, an activist really comes from my mother's side who was part of the AIM movement in the 1970s. So, you know, it, it seemed very natural for me to go um, into um, some sort of political stance like ARA through SHARP, um, um, but, uh, you know, dealing with uh, the bureaucrats and all the other anti-racist organizations that kind of turn their nose up at, uh, you know, the street kids or the punk rockers or the, or sharp or whatever, um, you know, a lot of the times they're not the ones that are sitting in a coffee shop across from some Nazis that are, you know, planning to beat the crap out of you when you uh, go step outside. So, you know, you're dealing with bureaucrats and kind of like, uh, idealized um, scenarios opposed to, you know, dealing with something that, you know, when you're at the bar or when you're at the street, you, uh, you know, and you run into a hammer skin and you want to smash your face in, what are you going to do, right? I think I agree with everything Thomas just said. I feel like one of the things that has changed, honestly, and this is, you know, cliche at this point, but the rise of the internet has created an environment where people who want to be engaged in politics in a virtual format have the capacity to do that. In a lot of ways, that's really wonderful. But I think it has also limited the capacity of uh, sort of, you know, what we've been talking about this evening, public facing, um, popular mass oriented groups to take a confrontational stance. And instead you end up with a kind of rhetoric of confrontation on the internet, but a reality of either people not showing up to events or if they show up to events, they show up to events on the expectation that there won't be any kind of meaningful uh, confrontation. And obviously it's not always the case, right? There are lots of, of moments of confrontation to this day. Um, I, I think, one of the things, one of the lessons that I felt was really highlighted in the opening vignette that I read is the notion that in some instances, certainly not all, but in some instances for ARA, the threat of violence was sufficient to actually prevent violence from breaking out, right? Um, but that only works sometimes. And we say in the book on any number of occasions, ARA had to back up its words with deeds, um, you know, so you don't end up, we don't want to have an empty threat. Um, but at the same time, I don't think I knew anybody in ARA whose first and foremost objective was violence, right? Violence was a tactic that had a place, but it was not the, it was not the goal um, for any of us. And that I think is really important in a lot of ways sets the anti-fascist side 
clearly apart from the fascists for whom there is really a kind of cult of, of violence for a lot of fascist groups across North America, across the world. Yeah, I do definitely like, like feel that, especially like with my involvement and like in the last few years where um, fascist movements are violent movements, right? And I feel that anti-fascist movements, it's, it's, our goals are so broad, right? It's not domination, it's social justice, um, it's, it's enacting mutual aid in the community and things like that, right? Uh, but from the centrist perspective, they kind of see both sides as, as the same, as the same sides argument. Uh, Kristen, did you ha have anything to say on this issue? Um, I think you've, I think you've covered it really well, actually, <laughs> to be honest. I mean, I think we, we all, um, struggled with that as, you know, in Toronto, definitely like this sort of division between the, you know, it be, be, um, identified as violent or whatever. Right. And while there's certainly, you know, it, yeah, I, I don't really have more to add actually. Sorry. Yeah. Back to Winnipeg, like Thomas was saying earlier, it's just for, for all cities in Canada, it's like people here have like in general are very confrontational, right? It's like you, you say something, you do something to the wrong person, you're getting punched. Like, it's just the culture here. It's the, it's just the overwhelming, like, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where, you know, what we do for fun is watch men chase a puck and fight each other. Right. That, that, that that's our culture here. So in the terms of, in terms of anti-fascism, especially in the last, it, it you know, in, in this like latest wave was, you know, fighting all sides, right, right? So we're fighting, confronting fascists, then we're looking out and, and dealing with the police. And on top of that, we're dealing with the center left and whatever, you know, left in general, criticizing us and our tactics. But I will say something, those tactics are effective, right? Like in Winnipeg, we were able to completely disband the sol soldiers of Odin, with the same tactics that are used in this book, right? We go where they where they go, we confront them wherever they go, we expose them for who they are, and they cease existence. Proud Boys, huge issue in, in parts of Canada, huge issue in, in the United States, completely cease to exist because there's that threat where what where you basically show up, you're coming in to you're coming into the lion's den. We're the ones with the power here, right? We can ruin your lives, you can't ruin ours, right? So having that, I feel that threat of we're going to ruin your life. We don't, we don't, you know, violence isn't, isn't something that we're, that we're into, but we're willing to go there. And I feel if folks uh, know that, like, like if these fascists know that it, it's kind of hands off, like it is in Winnipeg, like they won't come, they won't confront the, like, I know, I, especially now the big thing is them showing up to drag shows. Do you know what I mean? Like, and, and things like that. They know that if they were to, were to do that here, is that all hell's gonna break loose, right? We're gonna, they're gonna be exposed, they're gonna lose their jobs and, you know, like, and then they cross a line, like they're gonna get a heel to the face, right? It's cause, you know, our drag queens are militant. So they're not gonna put up with that. And I think, you know, it's strange for me to, to speak to other folks in other cities, um, like in the same movement and kind of finding out how they navigate through that, like basically fighting all sides now, not just the cops, the fascists and, and the critics, you know what I mean? Um, do, do you folks have anything to add on that or um, you know, any comments? I do have uh, or... a story. So, uh, uh... Minneapolis is very similar to uh, to Winnipeg, and I remember going to an ARA conference in Minneapolis, and uh, you know we were talking about issues of violence and about fighting, and you know how you know a lot of the Nazis are so much bigger than we are, and you know they're a bunch of roid monsters, and it's very difficult to, you know, even if we outnumber them, you know, 
to win a fight with him. And this little girl came and, um, sorry, I shouldn't say little, oh, this woman came who very short and, uh, man, she, she taught me some pretty, uh, vicious moves. She's all like, keep a, a pocket full of change or pennies. You throw it in their face and you have a pen or pencil in your pocket and you stab them in the face or in the eye that'll stop no matter how big the dude is. And I'm just like, wow, that's pretty, uh, pretty hardcore. But those are some of the practical uh, things that we would address that you wouldn't be able to talk like that in any other organization. And that's all about self-defense. It's not like we're going out trying to stab people. It's about if, you know, you were being attacked, these are the tactics that you need to use. So. Anybody else? I think I would, uh, the one thing I would like to kind of put out there is that, you know, I, in kind of a, trying to address these issues, like we were also very big into propaganda and like publications and we had a radio show and we uh, did, you know, public events like concerts and teach-ins and so on to, you know, be sort of human, right. To be, uh, visible you know and uh to you know put the argument forward in a kind of regular way uh, as regular people right just the way that you are now right and that i think helped people to understand like why we had the positions that we did right um so i, I think that piece is important it's about making the argument it's about having an impact on the discourse And we're kind of running out of time. Uh, now we're gonna take some Q and A's. Does anybody have any questions? Please click the Q and A button. I don't see any right now, but you know, please. So I'll give you a couple minutes to go ahead and do that folks. One kind of interesting thing, um, that we kind of, we're kind of dealing here in in Winnipeg is is that um, generally I feel that people are really supportive of FF1 ARA back in the 90s and that it, because like Tom Thomas said earlier we have this like long history of anti-fascism like you could even you can even bring that history all the way back to Louis Riel. Right. So when it was never hard for uh, us to do these sorts of actions, it was never hard for us to get people out to certain events um, because I feel culturally like it, it, it's built on a culture of resistance, whether you're talking back from Louis Riel to the 1919 general strike to the Battle of Market Square, like Thomas mentioned, up until now. There's an overall like... It could be, you know, someone who's has millions of dollars. Do you know what I mean? Someone who lives in the suburbs. They were involved in ARA back in the 90s. So they're going to come whenever these Proud Boys show up, they're going to mask up and they could be like my age, a little bit older. Do you know what I mean? So there's like this overall kind of like incessant need to get out there and support your community, which I think is fantastic. And I wish that kind of public facing popular anti-fascism would be more prevalent um, in a lot of places because I feel that um, I feel that a lot of it is being like literally masked right now right and I think once you take off the mask you put a human element to it like Kristen was saying like, we are regular people we're your neighbors and stuff like that oh we have a question from Todd why was music such an important part of the movement back then I'll start really quickly I feel it was a very important movement uh, very important to the to, to the music was that important because it brought everyone together into one certain scene, one venue. Um, and a lot of that music, especially the, especially the oi, the hardcore and the punk in the, in the, in the mid nineties was very anti-racist and anti-fascist. Um, on top of that, we had this infiltration from 
Nazi skin as trying to take our spaces, trying to show up uh, and take our spaces. So it was very adamant for us to defend them because we were like the numbers were so small, maybe a couple hundred people in a scene. We were all tight. And no matter if you were a skinhead, no matter if you listen to hardcore, no matter if you listen to punk rock, when the Nazis showed up, we all got together. We, we'd hate each other after that, but like <laughs> when they showed up, we all got together. So that, that's why I feel important. Uh, Thomas, do you have anything to add to that? Um, well, what really drew me to kind of the sharp skinhead movement was um, the two-tone bands from the 80s. So, you know, the Selector, the Specials, Madness, Bad Manners, um, the Body Snatchers, and um, the a lot of the music um, sang about, you know, the issues that they were having with uh, fascism in, uh, in the United Kingdom. And it really... Uh, really talk to me to a certain specific level, right? The ska music, the uh, the two different types of cultures coming together um, really appealed to me. And it appealed to a lot of people uh, in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, and that's the generation that I come from. And that's what really brought me to the scene was the two-tone mus- movement and the ska music that was associated with it. And it's still a big love for me now. Anybody else, Michael, Kristen? Yeah, I think, I mean, I totally agree with what both of you were saying. I think music can work in both directions, right? Music can draw people into a political movement, but it can also draw people who are politicized into a kind of cultural space in a way that's really powerful. And I, I, I don't know, you know, I don't know why, I guess to answer Todd's question, I don't know why it was so central to ARA, but it was consistently all the way back to the early, you know, syndicate groupings and beyond, and all the way through as the demographics of who was in ARA really shifted, the music piece, the centrality of music remained absolutely essential to how ARA functioned. And I, I think that was, uh, a definite secret of its success, right, was the, you know, I I think it's one thing, we've talked a lot this evening about the value of militant confrontation, Um, but if all you're, if all you're doing collectively is militant confrontation in the streets, it can get a little tiring in a lot of ways, right, (laughs) and what is great about music is that it's a way for people to build the sense of community that allows them to be willing to take the risks in the streets, but also to recharge after those sorts of incidents. I really loved, I just want to say, Thomas, your photos were amazing. And I particularly loved that picture of the concert where you're able to say, look, here's a band on stage. Later, after this photo was taken, the, the, the confrontation came to us, right? Um, and that the band was part of fighting back, right? That's, I think, speaks really, really speaks volumes about that linkage between music and, um, and, and protest in the array. Wicked. I just want to bring up, uh, I don't know if Thomas was around in Winnipeg, that Dropkick Murphy show, like, I think it was 10 or 12, like 2010, 2012, where the exact same thing happened, a bunch of, you know, people started zig hailing or whatever. I don't know if they're being serious or not, but like, you know, the whole crowd turned in and, and Dropkick Murphy's jumped off the stage. So it was pretty wild, but that's just, you know, that's just the thing. We it's, it's loud, aggressive music. Um, you know, it attracts people who want to release. Right. Um, but yeah, don't be a Nazi at a Dropkick show. Um, we got a second, well, we have two more questions here. Um, Oh, three more questions, actually. Well, awesome. Thanks, folks. Um, so the first question we're going to touch on is two questions. First, if there was any one thing from ARA era that you could do differently, what would it be? Second, given the, given the environment in 2023, what would you advise to, to activists fighting the far right today? I'll let you guys in. Anybody? I feel like that's a really tough question. One thing you would do differently. Kristen, what do you got? 
Um, one thing that came up when I was interviewing people was um, there was a, at some point, the transition, like a uh, kind of uh, mentorship for like the next generation kind of somehow dropped off, you know? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there was, it went through like two, three, four generations of like leadership, I would say over the period, you know? where people were most active but somehow we um didn't pass it off at the end like to, to new people coming up and so you know what would that look like to do that more consciously what what kind of um, education or, or like expectations could people have of people coming into the group like you know it was very in everything was very informal and maybe that's okay but like in the end, it kind of didn't work, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, that's that would be food for thought for me if I got to do it over. Anybody else want to jump in on that question? If not, we'll move. Oh, Thomas? Yeah. Um, what would I do differently if I could? Um, screen our new members more diligently. You know, we uh, we did have a a, um, a really hard time within UAR about uh, defections. Um, people, uh, you know, coming over for scene and having a good time, and then going going off and either dating Nazis or joining and hanging out with them, and uh, it it became a real problem. And you know, if we had some foresight or were able to, I don't know, interview them or had a little bit more foresight on who we admitted into the inner circle, I think it would have been a lot safer for everybody. Anyone want to touch on the second part of that question? The second question there would be, what would you advise to activists fighting the far right today? Anybody? That's always That's such a, a hard question. I, I mean, I think there's a million things. Um, I, I guess the one that comes to mind right now is to um, not uh, not let the perfect be the enemy of the good, I guess. You know, I mean, I think we talk about it a lot in the book. One of the things that was really characteristic of ARA was uh, repeated and generally open disagreements about politics. We were not ideologically rigid. And, you know, there's problems that come with that, certainly. But one of the big advantages was it meant that we were kind of constantly involved in a really dynamic set of political discussions that helped motivate people to kind of keep going um, in a way that, you know, I think, I don't know about the rest of you, but I certainly have been in my share of groups that you know, decided we had all of the answers and then you, you know, you're, you've narrowed yourself down to three people who agree on all of those answers and you can't, can't do anything with that. Um, ARA by not, by deliberately not attempting to come to firm conclusions, even about basic questions like what is fascism? Um, it, it allowed a really wide range of people who were motivated to work together to continue that work rather than get bogged down in, um, you know, uh, very narrow ideological questions. There's a space for that. Certainly, it wasn't like we didn't have those conversations, but we didn't have to come to firm answers or to, you know, expel people who disagreed with us about many of those questions. That, that would be one piece of advice. Yeah, and I feel that uh, like in the modern age of, of this new incarnation of anti, anti-fascist, anti-racist work, like it is very sectarian, um, you know what I mean? Where it's like anarchists are on one side, communists are on one side. And I like, it's not here so much in Winnipeg, but I do see that happening in a lot of places and stuff like that. So um, that's good to, good to bring up. All right, so we have a, another question here. Uh, do you... Have any stories or lessons from ARA working with broader and sometimes more liberal anti-racist movements? Leave that up to 
for you folks to decide. Kristen, I feel like you had some good stories about that from Toronto. I don't know if you've got anything you want to share. Um, yeah, I think that all of those relationships were important in our case, definitely. You know, like we weren't isolated from the rest of the left. We weren't isolated from the rest of the anti-racist movement. Um, and I guess... It was interesting actually talking to some people from some of those those organizations 20 years later, you know, <laughs> and uh, like hearing, oh, yeah, I guess we were all a little bit more sectarian than we needed to be, you know, <laughs> that's that was kind of the reflection that I was hearing back from people. But I mean, I think that, yeah, we we, we did try to be to show up you know to be there when other people were leading things and not to take them over but to just contribute to those activities as they were right and not to apologize for ourselves but to like be there for other people too and i mean that's I, there are a number of examples like that in the toronto story um coalitions and so on that we participated in and um, that was important work for our chapter. I think there's, um, it seems to me that there's sort of smaller actions and bigger actions. And many of the smaller actions, it was often just ARA. And, and I think that that's okay. Um, the larger actions, and that could be anything from, you know, uh, a big, opposition to a Klan rally um, in some city in the Midwest, or it could be, you know, I'm thinking about going uh, to the um, FTAA protests in Quebec City in 2001, um, you know, where there's massive numbers of people from a wide range of uh, political stances with different objectives. And, uh, you know, I think to some extent, that the the Quebec protests in 2001 with this sort of embrace among at least some of the, the the participants of the concept of diversity of tactics was a real victory for the kind of work that ARA had been trying to do for a long time with mixed success of being able to say, hey, we're not here to, to you know, get in fights with you as liberal anti-fascists. We're here to add an additional kind of layer of protest to the mix. And we think ours is better than yours and we can hold them side by side and, and you know, check out the results. Um, but it was not, uh, you know, largely, it was not about um, conflict with those liberal organizations when that could be avoided, right? Now, there are places when it couldn't be avoided. There are places where liberal anti-fascists are ratting out people in ARA or ARA adjacent people to the police on that basis, you know, that sort of horseshoe notion that, oh, you're extremists, they're extremists, they're all bad. Um, and we have, we have, you know, some criticisms in the book of groups like uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center and um, the Anti-Defamation League that participated in that kind of, um, you know, divisive uh, organizing. Um, but in general, that was not our, our, I think our primary approach was to, to kind of put our work alongside other forms of work that maybe were more liberal um, and say, judge for yourselves, see what works. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to ask the last question here. Is racism handled only in, con in a confrontational way? Can dialogue be established? Arguments advance more in a way to understand. I'll step in here first, just to give you some examples here. I try as an organizer um, to reach out, to reach out to, to, these, to these guys, to these groups, more in, in, in a way where they're engaged and they know I'm a real person. And, and the number two, that I'm not talking any shit. Like I'm about to do exactly what I say I'm going to do. But number two, what that does, is it opens up dialogue, right? I've had people who were involved in just being a regular MAGA white nationalist all the way up into like being involved with the Proud Boys leave because they talked to me because I told them what I'm about, what I value in life, 
and it's very similar to what they value, right? The only problem is I feel that a lot of times they're being led astray by their own grievances and their own frustrations, right? So if you add a human element to it, you can do that. And, and you know, I've had great success with talking to folks and like, still, I mean, to this day, I, I text, I message a couple of these former Proud Boys, just check up on them, see how they're doing. They're living good, fantastic lives. They, they're learning a lot. They've, they've, under, they've understood a lot um, just by having that conversation. Um, so, so yes, I mean, there, there is way more that you can do other than confrontation, but I feel at times, uh, in a community sense, when they're trying to invade space, take space, I feel confrontation is necessary. Anybody else want to jump in on that? Um, I feel like I've been talking a bunch, but I'll try and be brief. I think one of the things that a number of us in ARA, uh, kind of a way in which we often viewed um, ARA's confrontation with fascists was that there was a sort of competition going on, especially in largely white spaces for who can successfully recruit marginalized white folks into uh, a militant space. And, you know, there are people who could go either way, right? Um, and, in those sorts of circumstances, I think dialogue is really powerful. Bringing people to uh, you know, a punk show or whatever it is can be a really great way to bring people in um, and effectively inoculate them or prevent them from being drawn to uh, fascist organizing. You know, there's, there's uh, a reason why a lot of young people are drawn to fascism, right? It can be exciting, it can be taboo, it can be, um, you know, uh, there's a, a, an adrenaline rush. And I think in many circumstances, ARA was trying to offer something directly competitive to that and, and diametrically opposed, of course, in an ideological sense. Uh, and I think that that is absolutely a space where that kind of dialogue can be really powerful. Um, you know, when you're dealing with people who are more ideologically committed, the, the more committed they are, the less viable that path becomes, it seems to me. Oh, you're muted, Omar. Oh, sorry. Uh, so that's it for questions now. I'm gonna hand it over to John here to kind of top everything up. Until then, he's probably gonna tell you the same thing, but definitely pick up this book. It's fantastic. It's got great resources. It's going to help a lot of people in in, uh, in the next few years, definitely. Omar is entirely correct. I'm going to echo exactly that. But before I do, I just wanted to express a little bit more gratitude uh, to, again, the University of Regina Press for helping to make this book and this event a reality. Uh, to all of you folks for joining us here tonight and for all of your involved and really interesting questions as well. This video will remain live on YouTube. So if you'd like to rewatch it or share it with anybody, please do feel free to do so. It was a fantastic conversation. And we're so grateful to uh, Thomas, to Michael, to Kristen for taking this time to be here with us. Us tonight and Omar to you for sharing your own experiences and for wrangling the conversation. So, uh, so very grateful. I'm sorry, as I was telling Thomas, I wasn't able to find my old Intifada shirt to actually wear tonight, uh, but so grateful to all of you for all your work. <laughs> yeah. So again, that's We Go Where They Go. It's an incredible book, an incredible resource, and we have it at every McNally Robinson location. So just get in touch with us and we'll find a way to get you a copy. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us and have an excellent night. Thanks. Good night, everyone. Thank you all.